Hey guys, I'm here in Southwest Colorado. The town is called Cortez. We are less than a half an hour out from Mesa Verde National Park. And I'm here with my two new friends, Kathy and Grant, who have an incredible, continuously developing permaculture farm situated here in the high desert. They also have an Airbnb where we're staying. And I just cannot wait to show you around and hear a little bit from Kathy. So let's go. I I've lived in Southwest Colorado for 24 years. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have five children and we found this property eight years ago. It was truly a gift from Yah. We call it the Permaculture Provision Project and all about God's abundance and how he provides for us. And we have been building since then and our first thing I think major thing we did was build our swale which is 3,800 feet long and 15 feet wide the length of our 80 acres and um, the first year God blessed us with seven one inch rain events so you do the math it's a lot of water and we praise him for that because if you've seen Jeff Lawton's videos approximately eight to ten years once you put a swale and a spring should form on your land, and that's what we are hoping for. So this is their major swale right here. And what is amazing is that they kept this on contour for a huge amount of the property for 3,800 feet. And they measured this properly. The water comes this way. And the main goal in all of this is you want the water to stay on the land for as long as possible so the water can seep in the earth can drink of the water and store the water. And uh, they know this very well that if the water goes in, at some point, if enough goes in, it's got to come out somewhere. It's about eight feet down to bedrock. And we believe that our spring should pop up in this area. And we have seen wet patches, so we're hoping somewhere in here. We'll see a spring pop-up. Yes, we are in the middle of a major drought and we are planting hundreds of trees. We're so grateful. We now have three Airbnbs, which we never even thought was in the scope of this project. And we have people, beautiful people that come here and share with us what they're doing and we share with them what we're doing. We also have a program that we do here called workaway.info. We've had 150 workers from all over the world during these eight years that have blessed us with amazing amounts of labor. Uh, hey, my name's Kyle. I'm here from the University of Nebraska. I'm a senior. Uh, I came to Kathy's place through Workaway, and I was just looking kind of for a summer adventure just to come out here and just to kind of learn something new. I've also always been interested in permaculture, just recently actually, and I thought this would be the perfect place to just kind of learn a few things and like be able to stay out here for two weeks and just have this experience. I think it'd be a great opportunity to learn how to like live more sustainably. And I mean, Kathy obviously knows what she's doing, so this is just a perfect opportunity, I think. Um, yeah. We just keep going. I wonder when we're ever gonna stop building, but um, it's a lot of work. Um, but incredibly fulfilling. So we started um, this project in 2014 and my husband had taken the Jeff Lawton permaculture course and you can't actually do his course without having a project so it's perfect. We had to take the course and do this project. I am basically a city girl, so is my husband. Um, we did this project with some background knowledge in building. Our two sons are builders, so we had their knowledge, their help, but I was not a camper, and this I had to come out here every day and build a fire and start cooking and living without power, water. Uh, learning all these new skills was pretty dramatic, <laughs> and it actually has changed my life, and I am so grateful for the the shift in seeing God's provision in what I do and how he provides for us. The building that we designed here, the buildings, were all done on SketchUp. So passive solar 
and then solar power, rainwater catchment systems, basically what you see in original homesteading. So we have greenhouses mostly on all of our southern sides of our houses, making sure the eaves are long enough so that the sun does not come into the space in the, in the summer, but it is fully in the space in the winter. So in the winter, this greenhouse will get to about 110 degrees. I just open the door and then I have a bathroom fan out there that funnels the heat down into my kitchen space. So I'm using that heat all year round. And how well has it um, benefited you guys like temperature wise and things like that? Like, Well, at night, I never turn the heat on in the winter. There's no way it's just warm enough because of this greenhouse. Now this greenhouse is about to be opened up completely. All the windows will be opened up because it'll get too hot, but the sun, you can already see the line. There's no more going to, there's not going to be any more sun in here at the end of the month. So that'll be nice and cool for us. And that was Google SketchUp, right? Like yes. it helped you. You can dial in the whole year and watch the shadows when you're drawing it. And then these are my soil blocks. These all have to be transplanted. And um, what I like about them is you're testing the seed and you don't have to have a bunch of stuff, but that's the plant right there. And this has 35 plants in the blocks. And this is late, but we had too much wind last week and I couldn't get these in the ground, but this is my lettuces and those will go in a shade, shaded bed so I can have lettuces. And this is not my normal year. This is a rest year. So a lot of these plants are um, like trees. We're going to try bamboo this year and um, stinging nettle, uh, lemongrass, pink dandelion, some kales and a few tomatoes. Oh, then the yellow horn tree. We're going to try that for our oils and then our um, restart our vineyard again with uh, the Baca Noir. This is my wintertime clothesline so that I can keep my, I don't have a dryer. It's just outside or inside on a line, so. So what is the cat's name, by the way? Lynxie. And she's in like, I mean, she just gets in everything, everything, doesn't she? One of the things I admire about you guys the most is your architecture and your ability to, to build such amazing um, structures and uh, just the ability to actually carry it out really well. I feel like everything I build is like a jerry rig, but you, like, uh, well, and maybe I have some sons that will not let me do that. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, like, yeah, I mean, maybe you guys feel a very similar I'm way. Like, Get the duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so, um, so, who gets involved with that then? Like, so, so it's you guys, and what do you do? Um, what does Bob do? And then, what do your sons specialize in? I studied. Um, interior design, commercial interior design. And I have a degree in that from um, La Roche College in Pittsburgh. And I, I worked on skyscrapers um, my first part of my career. So space planning was my specialty. So whenever we want to build something, I look at the space and do a lot of drawings on how to function, that space should function. And so when I look at it, like when we planned this great room in here, I have five children. I added spouses and then I added grandchildren and my son was like, can we make it this big? And I'm like, no, it has to be that big. <laughs> so <laughs> to fit everybody. And then all the guests that we have quite frequently, I want to make sure it's big enough. And we've actually been able to sit um, 50 people in there, believe it or not. And we have classes and so it suits our needs. And I, I look at need and how the space can be designed. And uh, so, and then we use SketchUp a lot for the sun studies and proportions. What's the sun look like? Wind. That was another thing. We put doors on incorrectly and the wind was catching the doors. I'm like, okay, that's wrong. Got to change that up. Put the doors and the screen doors the opposite way so we don't have issues. The right materials. Uh, you learn by mistake. Thank goodness we haven't had too many mistakes because um, I think that's the biggest problem. When you design and build, you don't want mistakes. So test them, test things out. Like the rocket mass heater, we must have tested it outside six or seven times before we brought it inside and made it function. And it works beautifully. So testing is important.
On a rocket mass heater, it's a J shape that goes up. There's another chimney like this inside here, same size. And then there's a circle of chicken wire with an insulation of perlite and clay that we've mashed up against the walls. So there's a space in here between the barrel and the chimney. And then there's also a two inch gap. We've shimmed it up so that the chimney is two inches below the top of here. So when you go to, this is the kindling from our building site, and then the local truss company drops off the truss ends and we burn this in there. Put that on fire. And then because of the construction of the J-tube and the vertical wood, it burns so efficiently coming through here that there is actually no ash. I clean this out once a month and like that much. The sides, I can stand next to this just like this and not roast. If you were to do this on a normal wood stove, you would roast. So all of the heat is coming and going down this into this chamber here, this tube, through this bench, which is 25 feet long, and then up that chimney there. And literally, I can go and touch that flue, and it's not going to fry my hand. Heat goes through here, up this chimney, and out as vapor. And what's so cool about this is this whole bench gets heated and then will radiate all night long. My husband and I will finish dinner, close that up, go to bed, and then we don't have to come back down at all. We lose about three degrees in temperature. We have a 15-foot ceiling in here. And the massive staircase on this end, I, I def <laughs> you can't do that with a wood stove. You just can't. So it's very nice, comfortable, and very efficient. A wood stove, a normal wood stove, 50% of the heat goes through the chimney. Mine is going into the battery bank here, which is the bench. What comes out of our chimney is vapor. This will not be hot. This is single wall pipe not triple or double wall pipe because all the heat is in the bench. This we call the lodge where my husband and I live and it has a boot room, a great room, a, a nice kitchen and then on the front side which is the southern facing side is a full two-story greenhouse and then we have a cabin in front of that building which is a uh, vacation rental and then we also have a container, a house up at the hill that is another vacation rental. And then we also have a tent in the back 16 by 25, which we built. And that stays up all winter. And that's also a vacation rental. This is beautiful. Yep, yeah. I gotta get this ready the next guest. And these sides open up so you have a nice cross breeze in here. And we have solar for this so it's all run on solar. One of the things that we realized in the beginning is we needed nitrogen fixing plants. And we really like the honey locust. And we put, um, when we planted, we would take a honey locust and a pea shrub. Something and a pea shrub. They ended up being great companion plants and helping them along the way building soil. So all along our property, you'll probably see pea shrubs everywhere. And we've really found that they're great plants, especially the, the height of them. They end up going about 16 feet tall. They're really good for this elevation and they're covered with yellow flowers. We just adore them. The hummingbirds adore them. Bees love them. I'm focusing this year on perennial vegetables. One of the things that I really like are all the herbs, things like artichoke, asparagus, raspberries, strawberries, things that are coming back every year. We are also doing the echinacea, the hyssop, the mince, 
the ba basil is not, but I constantly put basil in the ground. The onions that over continue to come up. Scarlet runner beans are one of my favorites because they go 20, 25 feet tall. They're, they look stunning. They have red flowers. We also use hops. They're stunning looking, but they also provide shade. We have a container house at the top that one side is going to be completely covered in hops. Um, you use the plants just not for the plant's sake. They need to do something. Just like the animals are here, they have a job. Our dogs take care of keeping the deer away, the predators away, the cats keep the mice down, the plants do something. We actually do spring beds. We'll bring in 400 trees and put them in a spring bed, tightly spaced, and we won't take them out of that spring bed for a couple years. Let them get established and then we'll take them out to see if they're ready to go out where we need them to go. That has been so beneficial to us. Not just planting them and then having them die. Oh, there's horseradish right there. So perennials are a big deal. Annuals are so much work. You'll see in the video of the amount of vegetables that you can get annually. But then you've got to process them. And... You know, I can basically a whole year. One guy asked me one time, said, how long do you can? I'm like, until the job's done. <laughs> and it could take a year. Um, I love how you basically spoke to the idea of function over form, um, where everything has a function. Um, it's actually a Hebraic uh, type of theme where, um, you know, the function really defines yeah. one's form in a way. Like the function defines the value and the expression and the identity of something upon the earth, which is just so beautiful. Yes. So you really focus on the function of plants and animals and really everything and how it all plays into the property, uh, into the picture, if you will. Right. And that has taken a long time for us to understand all that because in the very beginning, our first year, we planted 600 trees. We lost the majority of them. Trees actually love to be together. My orchard is tight. But when you space them thinking that they are need to be 30 feet apart, they don't have the ability to use the other tree to help and nourish them and protect them. So when you put them in a spring bed, they have that. And then don't forget that when you go and replant them, do they have other trees to communicate with and benefit from the protection of other trees? We got some cuttings from a dry land vineyard that has is on one acre no water and we're hoping that we can do that the same but we'll have to establish them first and we'll have about 75 vines so what i've learned is if you look at what you're doing everything it's a circle so composting is a circle so all your waste in composting including human waste um, can be an amazing way of building soil. And so looking at things in a circle, like we have been building for eight years, where does the scrap wood go? Well, number one, you can burn it. Number two, wood that is dead and in your forest, you can build hugel beds with it. So we have a large hugel bed at the road so that we can build that. Now, yes, in our climate, that could take forever, but we are doing things to put water in there to allow in the future the ability to put trees on it and soak up the water that way rather than having to use a drip system, whatever. There should be a sponge built from that. So everything we try to look at it as a circle and taking care of the land rather than manipulating the land let's take care let's be care give, caretakers of the land serve the land and then things go well believe it or not so and then all of a sudden because you put wood chips down you have mushrooms growing and you, you're like okay that's a miracle right there so yeah i think because of work away and the hospitality it has taught me and this may sound really strange. I didn't actually understand love until you learn to serve. And I'm not saying I'm good at it, but it is a lesson I needed to learn. And I'm so appreciative of Yah for giving me the opportunity to take 
anybody that comes here and have no judgment and just love them. And God has taught me through that, that everybody's can be loved and you get rid of your, your, um, judgments, you get rid of your racism, you get rid of it all because they're all his creatures. And so when I have people come, I interact with them and I'm the one that actually is being taught because God's showing me how to love. And I don't look at it as like, oh, I'm doing such a great thing. I'm like, okay, God says to love your neighbor as yourself. So go do it. And when you think about in public, that's not really easy to do. But God's allowed me to have an environment where people come here and I'm able to just share with them what I'm doing. And in doing that, I can pour out his love. I don't know why I have 120 acres. I believe the only way you can homestead properly is in community. Just my, my two cents. Yep. Next thing on my heart is the fact that at my age, I see everybody wanting to do homesteading or some kind of moving out of the city to find places where they can grow their own food. And I think that's all wonderful. That's what we've done. But in fact, I am seeing that community on a different level, maybe it's a biblical level, needs to happen for us to really survive. So many of the friends that I have had that have done farming over the last 10 years have burned out and are divorced. Because it actually, the model doesn't work. And I am at that level of burnout myself. But I want to now go to the next step. I want people to come and be a part of doing what I'm doing so that I'm not the only one doing it. And there's going to be a time in my life where I can't do it all, but I want to teach the younger people to do what I'm doing. And I don't see that happening today. Communists in the past have all failed, and I'm underlining all. There's several books written on it, and it doesn't work. If it's not under God, Yehovah, it won't work. Do I know what that looks like? I don't. But I'm praying that he will guide us because what's coming is beyond my ability to comprehend. But I know I'm supposed to be doing what I'm doing, but I know it's with other people. And I pray that, that because you guys came here, that we're actually going to be able to take those steps to finding the people that are supposed to be. I waited so that someday you would see it and come home from death to life from lost to found. Come into my right now, in the forefront of our minds, is to build a food forest and to allow God to move the way he needs to move. I don't want to put parameters on it, but the food forest is number one and we just keep doing that and keep allowing people to have an opportunity to come here, be a part of this and see what happens. Because if I put a, like, this is what we're going to do, it's my telling God what I want to do and I really don't want to do that. <laughs> so.